Let me call your attention to John chapter 20, verse number 15. John chapter 20, verse number 15. John chapter 20. In the New Testament, the book is St. John. The chapter is 20, verses number 15. Hallelujah to the Lamb. John chapter 20, verse number 15. You found it, you discovered these words. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? I want to ask the question this morning. Whom are you seeking? Thank you so much. Whom are you seeking? As we look at the world in which we live, we notice that people are seeking stuff. All right. We notice that people are seeking fanfare, popularity, we notice that people are caking on makeup to look like other folk. In the world that we live in, people are having nose jobs, booze jobs, and butt jobs. So they can look like other folk look. People are tucking and tightening, moving and shifting so they can look like other people. Every celebrity that comes out, somebody want to look like them. All right. Ma Meghan Markle married the prince. Every young woman that could halfway look like her went to see the plastic surgeon. Lord they wanted the head to be shaped alike, the nose to be shaped alike. But as long as she was on suits, that was okay. They didn't want to look like her. People are seeking other folk, and they want to not only look like them, they actually want to portray their lives as if they are them. Whom are you looking? Whom are you looking to seek? Whom are you seeking? I submit to you today on this Resurrection Sunday, you need to seek Jesus and Jesus alone. I submit to you today that this is the Christian high day, and as we look at this Christian high day, we need to remember what the day is really all about. It's all right to party. It's all right to get together. It's all right to fellowship. But you must not forget that this day is about Jesus. In an attempt on last week, and I pray that God got through, I, I used a rally to stand next to me and present to you the gospel message in two different languages. Very simple. Very impactful. And hopefully very convincing. The God that we serve has given his son. On this day, he has, he has resurrected his son. The God that we serve. We celebrate this day. Now, historians can't really tell us whether it was this day or not. But we believe that on Thursday, that they arrested my Lord and your God. We believe on Thursday, Judith portrayed him. We believe on Thursday that Judas took just a handful of money and turned God over. I said to you a couple weeks ago that you have to watch your buddies because your buddies will turn you in. Watch who you hang out with. Watch who you share your stuff with because your friends will turn you over when you cannot afford it and they will do it right at the wrong time. You have to be careful. You have to be careful who you share your time with, who you spend your time with, who you do things with because the person who knows your secrets the most 
is the one who can tell the whole story. Yeah, it's the one. It's the one that, that's looking to find something wrong with you. So we looked at Jesus praying in the garden in John chapter 17. As he prays in the garden, he prays for his apostles, his disciples. As he prays in the garden, he prays for the church of that age and the church of the future age. Jesus prays not only for himself, but he prays for us. He says, God, I want them to be one. I want the church to be one. What if the church of the United States of America would just be one? We are too busy. We are too busy trying to make sure that this location get all the attention. We are too busy trying to see if the church cross town will get all the attention. What if the church would be one as Jesus prayed that the church would be one? What if the household would be one? What if everybody got together, had a meeting, and walked out of the meeting in your house? Everybody decided this is the route we're going to go, this is the route we're going to take, and this is what we're going to do. Our finances are going to be lined up. We're going we're gonna to make sure the budget is in order. What if everybody was on one accord and they maintained that one accordness? What if, what if our government would be more concerned about the people they are serving than about a political party. What if we could just be one? What if children and, and parents would just be one? What if everybody would be on the same page? And let me tell you, if everybody was on the same page, in Jesus' name, our world would be a better place to be. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus prays this prayer, and when he prays this prayer, he says to us, we have to become one. We have to work on it. We have to be a part of it. We have to be a part of, of what Jesus is doing. Amen. When you look at the Bible, the Bible says real well in John chapters 18 and 19, after he, he prayed in the garden, he got arrested. Let me tell you, you need to pray before stuff starts happening. You need to pray before you get in trouble. You need to spend quality time, quiet time with God, asking God to bless you that you can bless him. Our focus ought to be on God. Our focus ought to be on, on God speaking to us and God ministering to us and God making a way out of no way through us. And when you pray, you ought not pray those selfish prayers. You ought to pray for somebody other than yourself. You ought to pray for somebody other than in your household. You ought to pray for other people. How many of you woke up this morning in prayer? The songwriter says, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Yeah, we, we, we sing the song, but did we really wake up this morning with our mind stayed on Jesus? Or did somebody get under your skin before you got out of the bed? Did somebody get on your nerves before you went to bed last night? Well, if that's the case, you ought to wake up in the morning with your mind stayed on Jesus. When we move, when we move to the chapter number 19, we find out that the Roman soldiers had a trial for Jesus, a second trial for him. Let me tell you, let me just say to you that you need to understand that Jesus went through great suffering for you. Jesus went through some stuff for you. Jesus, even though you wasn't born yet, Jesus had made up his mind that this bitter cup, that he would drink this bitter cup just for you. Amen. Yeah, yeah, they arrested him. They had, they had what the old folk back home would call a kangaroo court. They mean they already had the answer before they took him in. They had an answer before they even took him to court. They arrested Jesus, and, and, and we have to understand that he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Will you take just a few pennies to, to, to turn Jesus over? Will you take just a few pennies to betray your friends? Would you take just a few pennies to, to, to just say, here he is. And, and not only did Judas turn him over, he betrayed him with a kiss. It says to us that we got to be careful who's kissing on us. I said you got to be careful who, who's kissing on you because every kiss is not a farewell kiss. 
every kiss is not a good morning kiss. You have to be careful who kissing on you because they don't know and you don't know many times what the kiss really means. Judas enters into the garden. He enters in and he says to them, I'm going to point him out. And the way I'm going to point him out, I'm going to kiss him. He gonna, he's going, see, it wasn't abnormal for men to kiss each other on the cheek during those days. But I want to serve notice on every man that's listening. It's abnormal these days for men to be kissing on each other. It wasn't abnormal. They would greet each other with a kiss, and they would embrace each other. So, brother, let's just just, just come to the conclusion. We're going to embrace each other, and it ain't going to be very long. It's just going to be one of them church hugs. All right. that works. It's because it wasn't abnormal for them to greet each other with a kiss. But this was a deadly kiss. It was a kiss that was costly. It was a kiss that caused Jesus his whole life. It was a kiss that set a plan in place to impact the whole world. You see, before Jesus came on the scene and he died on Calvary, there was only one, one time that we would acknowledge. They would acknowledge just one time. But once Jesus came on the scene and Jesus died on Calvary, now we have stuff about that we say B.C. and A.D., meaning that before Christ and in the Lord, in the year of the Lord, it's because Jesus split time right down the middle. Confucius couldn't do it. Muhammad wasn't qualified. Aristotle couldn't make it. Only Jesus is able to split time down the middle. It doesn't matter what religion you are. You have to acknowledge the fact that we live in the, after Jesus' death, and we live in a time that Jesus has put in place, and no other man could put it in place. Nobody but Jesus. Jesus split time right down the middle. And that same Jesus that split time down the middle gave his life a voluntary death for us. Jesus did. When we move in and, and we see the crucifixion taking place in John chapter 19, we find out that the debt has been paid. We discover that Jesus paid the debt on Calvary over, over 2,000 years ago. These children has demonstrated what God has already done. God has set us free from brokenness. God has set us free from drugs and alcohol. God has set us free from low self-esteem. God has set us free from suicide. Only God can do it, and he did it over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. When you look at the crucifixion, a Roman, Roman soldier would not crucify a Roman citizen this way. Because crucifixion was a horrible thing. Crucifixion was so horrible that no citizen of Rome would be crucified this way. They beat him. They pulled plugs of meat out of his skin. They pulled nerves from his back. They put gashes in his back. They, they beat him and they scourged him. They tortured him. They walked him from one judgment hall to another judgment hall. And even as he's walking, they beat him. Even as he's carrying the cross, they are beating him. The Bible says they actually plucked hairs out of his beard. They tortured him. The Bible says not only did they beat him, they beat him until he was nearly unconscious. Mel, Mel Gibson does a good job of portraying in the Passion of Christ what Jesus went through, but Mel Gibson can't even paint the picture of what Jesus really, really went through. He does a good job. He does a great job of demonstrating to us the torture that Jesus went through. And when you look at the passion of Christ, you need to understand the word passion means to suffer. Right. I'm telling you, Jesus suffered for you and for me. He suffered a horrible death. They tortured him. They beat him. 
they nearly killed him just for a beating. And when he got to court, when he got to court, they already had their minds made up and they had their minds made up so much so until they had decided that what they're going to do is let Barabbas go. Barabbas is an executionist. Barabbas is a he's one that tried to overthrow the government. Barabbas is the one who was a terrorist. Barabbas deserved to die, and they choose to make sure that Jesus was the one crucified, and they let Barabbas go. It wasn't a setup. God already had it planned. It was just for you, and Jesus took the beating for you. He took the torture for you. He died for you. My Lord and your God, he died for us. And as he was dying, he was paying our debt, a debt that we owed, a debt that we couldn't pay. You see, sin has an awful debt to pay. Sin has a way of taking us farther than we want to go. Sin makes us stay longer than we want to stay. And sin will make us pay more than we can afford to pay. Sin has a way of getting our attention when God can't get our attention. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, he says it over and over again, even though I'm saved, even though I'm born again, every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. Can you identify today that you had an intention of doing right? You had every intention of doing the right thing, saying the right thing, even sinning and doing it the right way. But the devil has a way. Evil has a way of being right there with you. The Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, every time I would to do good, evil is present with me on every hand. Every time I look to turn to the left, the devil is coming from the right. Every time I turn to the right, the devil is coming from the left. And he is entering to the members of my body. That's why some folks say, God knows my heart. God knows, you know, God knows my heart. As they do their dirt, they say God knows their heart. It's because we have a sin nature in us. And our nature loves to sin. Our nature likes sin. Our nature keeps giving us over to sin. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 24, O wretched man that I am. Oh, beaten down man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this awful death? Verse 25 of Romans chapter 7 says, I thank God. Through Jesus Christ, he will deliver me. Amen. What the children have tried to say to you this morning through their dramatization is the fact that if you're going to be delivered from anything, it's going to take Jesus to deliver you. If you're going to move from that thing, it's going to take Jesus to deliver you. Because uh, you've tried to do it on your, on your own. You tried 12 steps and you couldn't do it. You tried seven effective ways and you couldn't do it. You tried a two-step, three-step solution and you couldn't do it. It takes Jesus to do it and Jesus alone. So he says the crucifixion was awful. They beat him. They falsely accused him. And they killed him. The Bible teaches that they led my Lord and your God up a skull hill called Calvary. The Bible declares that, that Jesus was put on a cross. He was put on a cross that he was made to carry. Jesus was nailed tight. Jesus was nailed in his wrist, in his hands. Blood came out. Agony was there. He was in pain like anybody else would be in pain. My Lord, it was nailed to the cross. They, they nailed him in his feet. And blood came out. Agony was present. He, they nailed him in his feet. It wasn't a fake blood. It wasn't ketchup. It wasn't, wasn't Kool-Aid. It was real blood that came out of Jesus. It was real agony. It was real pain. They killed my Lord. They made him carry his own cross, and then they pulled Simon of Serene out and said, you help him carry the cross. 
this dark colored brother helped him carry this cross up the hill called Calvary. I'm just trying to tell you that, that we need to be seeking Jesus. It's a problem. It's a problem, young people, when, when you grow up in a household where people have done everything for you and you get to be two and be ungrateful. It doesn't take 10 anymore. It, they come out the wound these days letting you know that this is mine. Hadn't hit a lick at a snake, but this belongs to me. And if you ask them questions, even at 10, they'll let you know, I don't owe you anything. I didn't ask to be here. Well, since you didn't ask to be here, I'm going to tell you how it's going to go while you're here. Jesus has done everything for us. He has laid it out for us. And we can't be like the one-year-old and be ungrateful. Thank you for showing up this morning. Thank you for setting aside the party time. Thank you for setting aside the Easter money and the eggs. Thank you for setting aside your own agenda to come to the house of prayer to hear about Jesus who prayed for you. The Bible says they nailed him and they picked him up. And when they picked up Jesus, who was nailed to the cross, they didn't care what pain he was in. They didn't care what agony he was in. They picked him up, meaning they raised him high. John chapter, chapter 12, verses 32 says, Jesus says in the King James Version, he says, "In I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The church ought to be about lifting up Jesus. We can have all the fun we want to. We can have all the fellowship we want to. We can have all the free time we want to. But the church ought to be about lifting up Jesus. Because when we lift up Jesus, Jesus does the drawing. You want to know how you put cheeks in the seat? You lift up Jesus. You want to know how people come and feel the place? Lift up Jesus. Because there's a difference between a swell and a growth. When, when there's a swell, when there's a swell, a group of people just, just, just flood in the place because they like what's going on. There's a swell. The problem with the swell, many times it's infected. Many times it needs to be cut. But when there's growth, when there's growth, God causes a growth. God, God causes things to, to blossom, and God causes us to bloom where we're planted. They lifted Jesus, and Jesus does the drawing. What if the church today would just lift Jesus? If you sell tea cakes, lift up Jesus. <laughs> if you have a garage sale, lift up Jesus. <laughs> If you drive in, in, in driver's education, lift up Jesus. If you dig in ditches, lift up Jesus. Because Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So they lifted him. What a mistake. They lifted him. They lifted Jesus. The devil just knew he had him. They lifted him. And when they lifted him, they followed it up by dropping him. That's why the old preacher back home would say it like this. They lifted him high, and they dropped him low. And when they dropped him low, there was a pulling on every vein. There was a pain in every agony. There was a pain in every extremity. There was the agony of the feet that most people would see. They dropped him in the hole. They didn't just ease him in the hole. That would have been too nice. Jesus died a horrible death, and it was, a not, it was not a nice death. They dropped him. There was a pulling on his lungs. There was a pulling on his legs. There was a, a pulling in his hand. There was a pulling, and they planted a crown of 72 thorns. And they didn't just nicely placed it on his head. They had thorns. They had long thorns, and, and they took it, and they pressed it down. Until the thorns went through his skin. And out came blood. And, and blood ran down his face. And it even ran down his back where the scars were, 
were left on him. They pressed it down. They didn't just sit it there, they pressed it. And if Jesus moved just a little bit, they pressed it the more. And he did it for you. It was a voluntary death. Jesus did it for you. They pressed this thorn, this thorny crown. They pushed it down on his head. They hung him. They nailed him in his hand. They ribbed him in his feet. They dropped him in a hole. And even in his death, he has the audacity to say, God, don't kill them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. How many of you can pray that way for your enemies? Somebody said the other day that the Lord said for me to pray for my enemies. And I said, Lord, kill them right now. Kill them right now. Lord, kill them in a hurry. Some of you get like me sometime, and I confess this morning. Some of you get to the point that I get to, and I get to point to point where, where King David got through. When D David's enemies were all about him, King David said, Lord, deliver me speedily. Deliver me right now. And then he says, make my enemies get what they deserve. But Jesus says, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus stopped dying long enough to save a man. He was hanging between two thieves. One on the right hand, Luke 23 and 32 through 33 says it like this. When they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, meaning Jesus. There they crucified him, one on the right hand and the other one on the left. There they crucified him, and the Bible calls them criminals. And you know, when somebody's wrong, they already find, always find some fault with somebody else. One of these criminals say, look, man, if you be the son of God, save yourself. And while you're at it, <laughs> save us too. <laughs> you ever had a friend, a family member, a buddy, that every time they mess up, they want to point their finger, if you hadn't have done it this way, then I wouldn't have had to do it that way. If you hadn't have said this, then I wouldn't have said this. So this man is hanging on the cross. He's a thief. He's a criminal. The Bible says in King James, he was a male factor. He deserved to die. But he pointed at Jesus. Now you say you're the son of God, right? Now not only should you save yourself, you ought to save us too. Why yet? You ever had a friend that always looking out for nobody but them? They don't care what you go through. They don't. You ever had children that's always looking out for themselves? You ever had grandchildren that they don't care if you have to get up at midnight and take care of their business? That they got themselves in, and they know who to call when they get in trouble. Yeah, you ever had you ever had a friend that 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 will call you at midnight, two o'clock in the morning? Now they didn't have any time for you while the sun was shining. But when they got in trouble, not only do they call on you, not only do they blame you, but they will show you where you were wrong. Here it is, another man hanging on the other side of the cross. Theologians believe that that the man on the left was the one that was talking trash. But the man on the right said, man, what's wrong with you? We are guilty of our sins, and we deserve to die. This is an innocent man. So I come to the conclusion the one on the left died in sin. The one on the right died from sin. But the man in the middle died for sin. And because of the man in the middle, now we can thank God for what he has done for us. It was the man in the middle, died on Calvary. He died such a horrible death until even the sinners began to see God in him. Let me tell you, if you're a Christian today, if you are a Christian today, when you're going through stuff, folk ought to see God in you. I, I know it's hard times. I, I know we, we're struggling with stuff, and I know everybody in every generation is having to do some things, single people looking for the right man or the right woman or the right man and woman. Let me say that again. 
Single people looking for the right man or the right woman or the right man and the right woman. Then you got married folk. Uh, the other day a guy pulled up to, to, to a fast food restaurant and while he was sitting there, he had a lady sitting next to him in the car and he, the guy took his order. And he took his order at the drive-thru and he asked him, said, well, what about your side, your side order? He said, oh, no, she's all right. <laughs> you'll get it later. <laughs> you'll get it. You, you, no, she doesn't need anything. So you have men who are low down and men on the down low. We have to get to a point in our lives where we understand the truth will be the truth because Jesus is the truth. Don't let other folk let you, let you think that you are nothing without them. Don't let people make you think you would never make it without them. Don't let them think that you're just trashed and you just messed up and your life is in shambles and you can't make it any longer without me. You got to learn to say bye-bye, see you later, Ariba Dutchie. You got to learn to say go on. Give them 50 feet, 60 feet, 5,000 feet. You need to get away from trouble. Jesus, hanging on Calvary, dealing with a dying life, but the man on the other side said, so when you get into your kingdom, whatever you do, remember me. Let me tell you, we need to remember Jesus, and we want Jesus to remember us. We need to remember Jesus because we want Jesus to remember us. We want Jesus to remember us. Jesus, when you get in your kingdom, remember me. As he was dying on the cross, the Bible teaches that the sun, the S-U-N, refused to shine. Because the S-O-N was shining brightly. The Bible teaches that, that while he was hanging on the cross, the, the moon dripped down like drops of blood. While he was hanging on the cross, the, the, the earth took an epileptic fit and, and began to reel and rock like a drunken man. While Jesus was dying on the cross, it became midnight at midday because it was dark out there. And he died on Calvary until one centurion soldier cried out, Surely this must be the Son of God. Yeah, he, he got to be the Son of God. No one can do these great things. No one can, can act like he act. No one can hold their peace. And you talking about holding your peace in the midst of death. Some of us can't hold our peace when the police pull us over. Some people can't hold their peace when mom and daddy said, Keep it quiet. Some people can't hold their peace because they got to be the first one to speak. A lot of folk have lost their job. A lot of people have lost their careers because they could not hold their peace. Jesus gives us an example of how we need to just hold our peace. We were unloading 18 Willow one day, and uh, this lady was just talking. I mean, brothers, she was just going off. I mean, she... I mean, she, she started singing at one point, then she started talking. I'm in the back of an 18-wheeler unloading truck to feed the hungry. And we're just working, and the brothers are just moving, and she's getting all in the way, and she's just talking, and she's just talking. And she thought she was going to be helpful, Mr. McGill. She asked me, Pastor, what do you need? I said, I need silence. <laughs> I couldn't tell her to shut up. I couldn't tell her to be quiet. My folk didn't teach me to do that. I said, baby, sweetheart, lovely, dobbly body, I need silence. And at that moment, it was just like this room. There was peace in the valley. There was silent. Jesus shows us how to hold our peace, even in the midst of trouble. Jesus died on Calvary. He died and the devil thought he had him. He died and in the midst of dying, he laid out his verbal will. Jesus sets an example for us. Everybody ought to have a will. Everybody ought to have some money when they die. If you don't have money, you ought to have some property. If you don't have property, you ought to have somebody to leave something to. Leave a sock to somebody or something. Leave a shoe to somebody. 
Everybody ought to have a will. Jesus stopped dying long enough to will his mama to his friend and will his friend to his mama. He says, John, this is your mother. He says, mother, this is your son. And the Bible says they went home together and they lived together from that point on. What you have to understand is when we look at the text in John chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 is a pericope here. And when we look at the text, some things are going on that we need to know about. First of all, Jesus is dead. Let me tell you, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea's borrowed tomb. In chapter 20, after they had buried him in a borrowed tomb, the Bible teaches that he stayed there all night Friday. He stayed there all day Saturday. He stayed there all night Saturday night. But bright and early at third day morning, on Sunday morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. He got up and the tomb was empty. You look at verse number one of, of John chapter 20. It says that Mary Magdalene got ready to go and anoint his body. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was yet dark, let me just stop right here and tell you, on Sunday morning, if Jesus can get up early from the dead, you ought to be able to get up early from the bed. I think I'll say that again. If Jesus can get up early from the dead, you ought to be able to get up early from the bed. Because he was dead. He was all the way dead. He was no movement dead. He was no blood, blood pumping dead. He was all the way dead. No inhaling, no exhaling dead. Jesus was all the way dead. And the Bible says he got up early that third day morning. While the dew was yet on the ground. Before Pilate could change the gods. He got up early. While it was yet dark, he got up early. Before the women could anoint his body, he got up early that third day morning. The Bible says that, that Mary Magdalene went to the, to the tomb and she was looking for him. It was still dark and she saw the stone had been taken away. Remember, Jesus says, in three days, I will raise up this body. In three days, my temple will be raised up. Now, the disciples knew it. Mary Magdalene knew it. Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew it. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, the sister of Jesus' mother, knew it. All of them knew that Jesus had said that I'm going to get up the third day. Everybody had been instructed that I'm going to get up. There was a promise that was made. And I want to say to you, Jesus always keeps his promise. Jesus will always keep his his promise. Jesus will always keep his promise. Mary Magdalene shows up. They have taken him away. See, the story was that they were going to steal Jesus at night. And see, it was a conspiracy theory. And we see today that people are believing in conspiracy theories before they believe the word of God. We believe, how do we know? Over 80 million people still believe plus, 80 million plus still believe in one theory. They still believe in one conspiracy. They still believe the big lie. And people are spreading it. And they are more angry than ever before. Let me tell you, after the election in November, it doesn't matter which way it goes. After you vote, go home. Get in your house. Secure yourself. It doesn't matter which way it goes. Because we, people are being, we are seeing people being more and more emboldened because of theories. And I learned in geometry that a theory is unproven. And when something is unproven, if it's not proven to be correct, then it's a lie. They believe the theory. More than they believed God's words. Jesus gets up from the dead. 
He leaves. The Bible talks about in verses 3 all the way to verse 15. It talks about John chapter 3 in verses through verse 15. It talks about the fact that Jesus got up and he folded his napkin up. He took his linen and folded it in one place and took his head napkin and put it in another place. When you get a chance to read it when you get home, he folded it, and he folded it right well. He creased it. He folded it. It reminds me of growing up. If our clothes wouldn't fold, if our clothes wouldn't iron, all trouble broke loose. We used to have jeans that when we, we, we get through ironing them and starching them, they would stand up on their own. And if they fall down, you got to go back and iron them again. Jesus sets the example for us. And when he sets this example, he gets up from the dead. The stone is rolled away. Now, let me just show you. The stone was not rolled away so Jesus can get out. Because Jesus can walk through walls. <laughs> Jesus, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so they could get in. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose, and he was seen. They need to see the proof. And I don't know about you. I have to tell the Lord every now and then, I want a Lord, I want a God that I can feel sometime and I can see sometimes. Lord, I walk by faith. I walk by faith and not by sight, but I want to see something sometimes. Lord, I want to feel you moving on the altar of my heart. I, I want to be able to testify of your goodness. But the problem is, if we're going to have a testimony, it comes with patience. It comes with test. And it comes with one test after the other. Jesus gets up. He folds his linen. And the Bible says he folds his head right. And he left it laying there. This is important. This is important that we know that Jesus left his headpiece laying there. He folded it all together in one place and put him in their separate places. Then the other disciple shows up at the tomb. The women like to brag on this part. They said the women were not lazy. They got there early. <laughs> they say, they say the, women, the women we had to go get the men. They, they, say, they say that Mary Magdalene got there so early because Jesus had done so much for you. Let me tell you, if Jesus has done a lot for you, you ought not be able to, to keep silent. If Jesus has done a lot for you, you ought to be able to raise your voice for him. If Jesus has done a lot for you, you ought to be able to walk in the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit if Jesus has really done much for you. See, you can't be cool. Suave. Laid back when it comes to Jesus. Every now and then, you ought to be able to say in your sanctified imagination, I am getting ready now because sooner or later the preacher is going to mention the name of Jesus. And every time he mentions the name of Jesus, I remember how he brought me out. Every time I mention, he mentions the name of Jesus, I can tell you I was broken and now I'm whole because of the name of Jesus Mary Magdalene gets there, then she goes get John and Peter. They get in a foot race to get there, and Mary Magdalene still didn't believe. And that's the pericope we're in now, verses number 11 through 15. But Mary stood aside the tomb, outside the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stopped down, she, she stooped down, and looked into the tomb. One thing you got to give Mary <laughs> credit for, she did look for Jesus. The problem is with us, when we get in trouble, we look for everything and everybody than Jesus. Ashi, we look for everything and everybody than Jesus. And when we look for everything and everybody than Jesus, then we ought to be looking for Jesus. We ought to seek him. Alexander, we ought, to, we ought to seek Jesus. And when we seek Jesus and we don't find him there, we know he has kept his word. She, she was weeping. And she was weeping, as the Apostle Paul says, as one who has no hope. She was weeping as one who has no hope because she thought that the conspiracy theory was true and Jesus was false. 
How many of you have come to the conclusion that the, that the Bible, all of it is true? Every bit of it is true. How many of you concluded that the Bible itself never contradicts itself? How many of you concluded that, yes, there are some figmentations in there, but you got to read it in content and context because the Bible is true and the devil is a lie? Because the, the folk back home would say, he walks with me. He, he talks with me. He, he tells me that I am his own. She is seeking Jesus. We have to get to a point every day of our lives where we seek Jesus. Seek him alone. We are seeking Jesus. Men will make you a promise. And they will break their promise, but Jesus will keep his promise. Early that Thursday morning, Jesus rises from the dead. They get there. They're looking for him. They can't find him. When you look at verses 11 through 15, you will find out that Jesus encounters Mary, and Mary encounters Jesus, and Jesus is mistaken as the gardener. She thinks he's just the gardener. She thinks that he is just the man keeping the flowers. It's always good. It's always good for me. I sit back and I laugh when, when, uh, when we're working around here and somebody walks in off the street and say, where's the pastor? I say, he was here earlier. <laughs> I, I'm just the mopper right now. <laughs> I, I'm just the guy sweeping right now. I'm just the guy pulling grass right now. It's always a good thing when you can humble yourself enough to do what you would ask others to do. Jesus is mistaken as the gardener. And as he is mistaken as the gardener, then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord. And I did not know where they found him. I don't even know. She said, she said, I don't know where, where to find him. I don't know where they took him. I don't know where they laid him. I don't know where to find him. Let me just tell you, Jesus is available to you today. You ought to be seeking him. You ought to be looking for him. But you ought to know where to find him. He's right where he was. He's right where he is. She, supposing he was the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, now she's accusing Jesus of taking Jesus. <laughs> Sir, if you carried away, now she's accusing Jesus of stealing Jesus. It says to us today that people will stick to those theories better than they will the word. And they're going to carry that theory from one person to the other. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you laid him. And I will take him away. Finally, Jesus approaches her and says, Mary, I want to stop here and tell you Jesus knows your name. Jesus, Jesus knows your name. He, he not only does he know your name, he knows your circumstances. Jesus knows your name. He knows your circumstances. He knows what you're going through. He knows your situation. Jesus knows your name. Don't get concerned about Jesus calling your number. One day he's going to call your name. God, God, never, God never has to call your number. You don't have a number because God has a, has a mind, a heart. He has the ability to make numbers count. He doesn't count numbers. And not only that, the, the Apostle John says, I saw a number that no man could number. Only God can. God doesn't call your, somebody said the other day, oh, yeah, God called her number. No, God didn't call her by number. He called by name. And one of these days, he's going to call your name. And it doesn't matter how many errands are in this world, he knows you by name. Doesn't matter how many Sues are in this world, he knows your name. And when he calls you by your name, you're going to have to answer. He says, Mary, Mary. She turned to him and she realized he was the rabbi. Who are you seeking? My question to you today, 
Whom are you seeking? Are you seeking things, fine stuff, or are you seeking Jesus? I recommend that you seek the one who gave his life for you. I recommend that you, you seek the one who died on Calvary for you. I recommend that you seek the one that they killed that was innocent. I recommend that you, cheat, you seek Jesus, the Lamb of God. I recommend that you seek Jesus, the great I am. I recommend that you seek Jesus. The old folk back home would say he's a bridge over troubled water. He's a light when we're dark. He is my leaning post. He is my walking cane. I recommend that you seek Jesus. As you celebrate today, don't forget to celebrate Jesus. If you didn't get your stuff, celebrate Jesus. If you didn't have it your way, celebrate Jesus. Because it was Jesus, I tell you, that marched up Calvary's hill. They nailed him tight. They lifted him high. They dropped him low. They stretched him wide. He died on Calvary. They took him off the cross. They laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. It was a barber tomb because of that third day morning. He got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. It is that Jesus we seek. It is that Jesus we live with and we live by. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to try Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus, the one who gave his life for us. Jesus, the one who died for us. Jesus that was buried in a barber tomb. He died for you. And he died for me. That same Jesus rose from the dead. And he's coming back again. Right now, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. Every time you confess your sins, Jesus is making intercessions for you. Whatever you have in your mind that's not clean, Jesus is making intercessions for you. As you confess your sins, Jesus is faithful. Jesus will forgive you of all of your sins. You don't have to be ashamed or shy of anybody because we're all struggling with something. Jesus of Christ, we are all struggling with something, and some of us are struggling with somebody. We struggle with stuff in our hearts, stuff in our minds. But when we give it to Jesus, Jesus can fix it. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Will you come? Amazing the door is open. Grace. If you want to receive Jesus as your personal How Savior, this is your moment. You ought to trust him. The door is open. Amazing.